All right, the subcommittees will come back to order. Thank you for your graciousness, for your time. Uh, obviously, 15 minutes in Congress is a lot longer than 15 minutes. My apologies. And uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and recognize myself for a series of questions. And then as we get into this, as some of the others uh, come back, typically when uh, this happens, we lose a, a whole lot of, of energy. So my apologies. Do not take that as uh, less than a uh, uh, of a priority, uh, just more as a conflict of schedules. Uh, we have 20 half meetings a day, and so hopefully this is a full hearing as as we go forward. So, so Mr. Thomas, let me let me come to you. We we've, we've got an issue when it comes to this whole procurement side of things. And what I mentioned in my opening comments was was the fact that I can go on Amazon and buy things cheaper than you can buy as a government contractor. How do we fix that? So just pure and simple, I know 12 days in, give me 12 days of wisdom uh, uh, and years of experience, if you could. How do we fix that? And are you all committed to getting it fixed where the American taxpayer qu quits reading about the purchase of $500 hammers? So uh, let me first start off by saying, y yes, I'm committed to fixing it. I mean, it's one of the reasons uh, when I was asked to serve um, that, that I decided to, to come back, right, to streamline uh, and simplify the, the procurement process. I mean, I think, you know, I think you raise, you raise a valid issue um, that, uh, that definitely needs to be addressed. We're, we are pretty excited about, uh, about the Thornberry Bill and the ability of the, uh, of the commercial marketplaces and GSA's role to sort of sponsor and broker those and help, help those make, uh, help make those work within the construct of the, uh, uh, of the federal procurement system. We think we think that's a, a real step in the right direction, and uh, you know, from our standpoint, I think we're supportive. We've enjoyed working with the committee on that, uh, or with the Congress on that particular bill, and helping you know helping you all shape that legislation. So you know, I think that that's a step in the right direction. There are other things we're doing to try and make it uh, simpler for vendors to get on schedule. Uh, so there's the making it easier initiative we have. Within, uh, within GSA, which aims to cut the amount of time and effort it takes, particularly for small and innovative businesses, to get on uh, the, uh, this, the schedules, the information technology schedule. We've seen, uh, seen some success there in terms of reducing the amount of time and effort that it does take. So we are, we are committed to it. We are, we are taking steps. It's a, definitely a priority for me. And as you said, 12 days in, uh, I'm listening, learning about what we're doing, and then also trying to come up with uh, thoughtful recommendations for, for how to get better. So let me, let me be a little bit more blunt, sure. all right? So you've got all kinds of pages, over 2,000 pages across agencies on what they need to do. Most of that is not read. It's, it's, it's essentially a big uh, dust collector that is out there that gets referred to if it says that we need to keep things the way they've always been. Uh, they refer to that 2,000 page document that most of them have never read. So how do we change the culture? Because there, I've found that there's not a whole lot of risk takers out there. And the minute that you do it, and, I, and I'm one that believes that we should be taking some risk and knowing that we will make mistakes. That if we do this, there will be times when we've made a purchase that is uh, not appropriate. At the same time, under what the GSA IG found, every purchase is a problem. Because if, if we're there, uh, we, we certainly can do better than the status quo. So how do we, uh, and maybe this is a question for both of you, how do we create a truly a condition where they're willing to take some risk and willing to get 2,000 pages down to 50 pages and not use it as their leverage to not change. Sure. So I'll, maybe I'll start, Rob, and then if, if you want to jump in. So you know, I think a, a couple areas uh, to help address uh, your question. So one would be um, in terms of encouraging people to take risk, there's a kind of leadership aspect to it, uh, and then there's a you know, statutory regulatory reform aspect to it. So from a leadership standpoint, I think uh, from the top uh, of the procurement organizations, we've got to, as you said, encourage people to go out, think about taking risk, and not necessarily punish them when they when they make a mistake. If you're if you're drilling for oil, it's okay to drill a few a few dry holes, right? We're not we're not necessarily going to fire you for that as long as you're you're doing your best and making an effort to uh, to comply with the rules. 
I think from a statutory and regulatory standpoint, you know, there's an effort underway. Uh, the Section 809 panel actually had a chance uh, to talk with uh, Dee Lee, who's leading that panel, uh, and I know she's testified before this committee right. a couple of times about some of the initiatives uh, that they are planning to undertake there and some of their interim findings. Uh, and I, you know, I told her I'm really excited about what they're doing. Uh, obviously applies to DOD, but I think there's a great chance to take some of that and apply uh, apply what they're doing to the civilian side of procurement as well. So I think I think there's there's opportunity there. So leadership and also then real concrete statutory and regulatory uh, reform. All right, Mr. Cook. Uh, yes, I think you're right about the. Uh, you're you're right about the risk averse culture. That's a that's a big factor. Uh, I think technology can help a lot in this. Uh, technology's changed so many aspects of our economy. Uh, people are shopping online. Uh, why isn't that possible in the federal government? That, that is, is it an area that's really ripe for change, and technology can be a big part of that, uh, of that change. All right. Thank you both. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, let's follow up on, on the Chairman's question. So he's talking about his ability to go on to Amazon, and uh, they will, if he's looking for a certain item, they will list 10, 20, 30 vendors, and they'll all have different prices, uh, some with shipping, some with not. But you've got, you've got an open marketplace there um, and creates competition and, and drives prices down. Uh, as, as Mr. Cook was saying. So I have a terrible problem in, in my area, in eastern Massachusetts, uh, in my district, where we got some big government construction projects going on, and I've got some good-sized companies, very, very skilled. Uh, these are not mom-and-pop outfits. These are five, 600 employees. And those, those contractors cannot bid on the work that's going on in their area. There's a secret handshake thing going on with the DOD. We, we cannot figure out how the hell to, to excuse me, how to, how to uh, get into that bidding process and, and open it up to competition. It is just shut down. It's a, it's a good old boy network. And, and look, I've been a member of Congress for, for a while, and we can't seem to penetrate that whole, you know, that whole operation. You got uh, retired generals that have sort of worked in there and, and uh, I know we're not getting the best price. We're not getting the best price. They're, they're, you know, they're driving it up because there's no competition. So, so let's go back to the, the, the chairman's initial question. How do we wire a system that on the straight procurement basis, we can use that competition that Amazon uses to just put the prices out there, say, this is what we need. Give us your best price. It, it would seem to be a fairly simple proposal, um, and, and it's working, you know, famously in, in private industry. Why can't we do that? So, Congressman Lynch, uh, thanks for your question. I think uh, I think we can. It's a short answer, right? I mean, I, sh I share some of your concern and, and frustration. As I mentioned, it's you know, it's one of the things I'd like to like to focus on uh, in my in my service at, at GSA. I think the bill, uh, the NDAA bill, goes some ways towards addressing that. Uh, there are, as you know, some specific uh, regulatory and policy concerns uh, that the federal government has that those of us who just buy as, uh, as private citizens through Amazon don't necessarily have to take into account. So we want to make sure that those are accounted for in, uh, in the appropriate way. But, but I do think uh, introducing uh, commercial marketplaces like that into the government buying process uh, should should yield some savings and some speed and and offer some uh, some simplification. When are we going to see that happen? Uh, do do we need to legislate that, or do you have the ability to do that already? Well, we're we're supportive of the legislation uh, that's um, that's before the before the Congress now, and we're we're hopeful that it will pass. Uh, and we you know as I said earlier, we we'd we'd, uh, we'd like to try and and fully implement it. We think there we think there are benefits there. So yes, le legislation would be helpful. All right. Mr. Cook, you got anything on this? Uh, yes, you're, you're right. The, um, the hurdles uh, are make, make the federal marketplace less competitive. It uh, disadvantages small businesses, as you were saying, five or 600 people, which is small, I guess. 
<laughs> but it disadvantages uh, companies uh, of that size and smaller, and it makes things more expensive because for the federal government because there are fewer there are fewer bidders. So we are working on the technology side to try to use the power of technology to open things up by doing things like making it possible to have uh, people buy things online in the same way they do at home. Uh, that's the goal, and that's what, that's what we're working toward. That's the way it should be. Yeah, I, I see, you know, so Raytheon is a big player in the, the uh, defense industry, and I see them, they have these small bidder conferences where they'll invite all these small and mid-sized companies mm -hmm. in to bid on parts of their contract. So, you know, if they can do it, I mean, we, sh we should be able to do the exact same thing. We should. Yeah, all right. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman. So let me do a follow-up with that because the gentleman and I agree on this. So here's what I would ask is, and I think you're referring to the language that's in the NDAA that you're hopeful that it gets signed into law. Is that correct, Mr. Section Thompson? 801, yes. Okay. So if if indeed that gets signed into law, that's one, one good area. But here's what I would ask you give this committee in the next 30 days is a list of both legislative and administrative things that could be done to accomplish what Mr. Lynch and I both agree needs to be done. And if you can report back to this committee with a list of suggestions on, on where the, you could have an administrative fix and where you could have a legislative fix to accomplish that task. Is, is, that, a, is that fine with the gentleman? That's perfect. Thank you, Mr. All right. Chairman. All right. The chair recognizes uh, the gentlewoman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today to discuss reforms. Uh, welcome. Um, happening at GSA. Early this year, I repeatedly petitioned the former Chairman Chaffetz to address the, some people will say conflict of interest, or some will say the appearance, or some will say the concern of our President's um, Trump Organization lease with GSA. Uh, during our organization meeting, I, I offered up an amendment that required the committee to investigate what I feel is a blatant conflict of interest regarding the Trump Hotel. It is our committee's responsibility to conduct oversight of the federal government, hence my concern about a political appointment. While my amendment was defeated at that time, I hope the committee's new leadership will re-examine these concerns. This is not a Democrat or Republican issue. The purpose of oversight uh, committee, as I understand and took my oath to serve here in Congress, is that um, we, as a government, ensure that there are tax dollars that are being used in our relationships and lease and, and all of those acquisition and, and allocation of funds for purchases are done without any disrespect of the taxpayer who is, has an expectation of government. And even though the Trump, uh, our president, has uh, moved his interest to a trust, placing his sons in charge is still deeply concerning. While the GSA has cleared the president of any contract violation, it's not hard to imagine how any future dispute could quickly go off the rails if there's any issue with the lease. Hence, a political appointment. So where is the, um, not where, I would say my concern, deep concern, is that you coming in, and, and I hear the turn as looking at this as an um, upstart or a new company, and all those, the vision and experience that you've had when you look at a, uh, a company that's coming in starting and how you can use innovation and, and all the things that you're bringing, which we so need in government. I appreciate it. My question to you, how does GSA plan on approaching future negotiations with the children of the President of the United States? And how do we take this beyond this current administration? Where is the future for anyone coming into the presidential office when it comes to leases with our government properties where it says no elected official shall enter into a lease. 
And given that this clause is standard practice to include on all leases, how can GSA do, what can you do to enforce compliance with this requirement? Thank you. Thanks for your question, Congresswoman Lawrence. Um, as you know, uh, I'm the commissioner of the Federal Acquisition Service. There's a, uh, a sister service within GSA, if you will, uh, the Public Building Service uh, that has an acting commissioner right now. So the, the question of leases and how we handle leases is really outside of my purview. I'm happy to take the question back uh, to my colleagues and, mm -hmm. and follow up with a, with a written response to you, if that's okay. So if it's outside, who has, um who does every person report to? The, the commissioner of the Public Building Service and myself, the commissioner of the Acquisition Service, Federal Acquisition Service, we both report to the administrator. In this case, it's an active administrator, uh, Mr. Tim Horn. Thank you. You're welcome. This gentleman, yield back. I yield back, sir. All right. The, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thomas, I want to address GSA's lack of cooperation with Congress. The Trump administration released an opinion issued by the Office of Legal Counsel on May 1, 2017, arguing that agencies and departments could ignore requests for documents and other information from members of Congress other than Republican committee chairmen. On June 7, 2017, Senator Chuck Grassley wrote a letter, wrote a scathing letter to President Trump urging him to reject the OLC opinion. He said, and I quote, every member of Congress is a constitutional officer duly elected to represent and cast votes in the interests of their constituents. Do you both agree with uh, Senator Grassley? Congresswoman Kelly, um, we certainly take uh, the committee and the Congress's oversight role seriously. I believe it's an essential part uh, of the system. We, uh, the agency evaluates every oversight requests on an individual basis, uh, and I'm happy to take that concern back okay. uh, and get it, get it addressed for you. Thank you. Mr. Cook, did you? Uh, this is just way outside my area of expertise, okay. and so uh, I'll just leave it to you okay. with, with what uh, Alan said. Every member of Congress has the constitutional responsibility to conduct oversight of the executive branch in order to inform our legislative actions. Since President Trump took office, however, GSA has adopted a new policy. This morning, GSA Administrator Tim Horn testified before the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure that GSA will only respond to oversight inquiries from committee chairs. Have either of you received any guidance, written or oral, on how you should respond to requests for information from members of Congress and their staff, and who communicated this policy, and how was it communicated? Uh, I have not. I have not either. Okay. The new policy appears to directly contradict an existing GSA policy on communications with Congress. On February 20th, 2015, then GSA Administrator Dan Tagarlini issued an order to GSA employees setting a policy for responding to inquiries from Congress. That order applies the same procedures for responding to all members of Congress and their staff, regardless of political party. Has Administrator Horn issued a new order to overturn that 2015 order? Are any of you aware of that? I don't know whether one way or the other. Yeah, I'm not aware either. Again, I've only been there 12 days, so I mean, right. <laughs> but, but I'm not aware of it. Okay. In the absence of a new order, that 2015 order is still in effect. So if you or anyone in your office is instructing GSA employees to follow a different policy for responding to Congress, you are telling them to violate a standing GSA order. The Whistleblower Protection Act requires that every executive branch policy on communications with Congress include language explicitly noting that the policy does not affect an employee's legal right to communicate with Congress. Has GSA included the language required by the Whistleblower Protection Act in communications to agency staff about the new policy on responding to Congress? Uh, Congresswoman Kelly, I, I, I don't know. I'm happy to, I'm happy to come back uh, to you with an answer on that, but I, I don't know, I'm sorry. Same here. Okay. Will you commit today to, to respond to requests, like you said, from members of Congress, regardless of whether they are Republicans or Democrats, or whether they are in the majority or the minority of Congress? 
Um, one thing that we are in the technology transformation service is very uh, nonpartisan. Uh, we don't care where the request comes from. I appreciate that. In Good. order to adequately address the significant issues that currently face GSA, it's going to require cooperation and a willingness to be held accountable in order for you to restore faith in the agency. And as you uh, can see just from sitting here that all of us work very well together, uh, the two chairs and the two ranking members, to try to get things done in this space. So um, we appreciate all the cooperation we can get. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for her question for yielding back, and we want to thank our uh, witnesses and the support staff who are here today uh, for you taking the time and filling us in. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>